So we have an exciting lineup for you. Uh, I'll just quickly run through the agenda. Let's see if I can get the uh, agenda up. Let's see, it's quite slow. Am I not pointing this in the right direction? Okay. It's not coming up. Is it possible that this isn't? Isn't working? Yeah, I, tr I tried. I, don't, I wonder if we could get a replacement. I'm not sure this is working. There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> our agenda for the morning, we're going to start with five speakers, five fantastic speakers, actually. Angela Falconer from the uh, Climate Policy Initiative will give us the broad overview of the, the context, the problem, and some possible solutions. Gabriela Weber de Moraes is going to speak from Finance in Motion, giving us some examples of their work. Then Mark Ellis Jones from uh, F3 Life is also going to give us some examples of climate smart um, lending. Alex Mulisa from Rwanda is going to talk about FUNERWA, which is Rwanda's green climate fund. And we'll finish with Ash Sharma from the NAMA facility. We'll then move into, um, we'll have a few clarifying questions and then we'll move into a, a panel where we'll discuss uh, what the vision for finance should be in the sector with comments from Lizzie Teague from, uh, from uh, Root Capital and Juan Cheng from the Green Climate Fund. So thank you everybody and we'll begin. Angela? Oh, sorry. Which one is forward? This one? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lini, and um, to CCAFs um, for co-organizing this event and getting such a wonderful panel together. Without further ado, let me hopefully move on to the next slide. Can you manually move on to the next slide for me? or? can just say next slide if you want to move it manually. Okay, here we are. Great. Thank you. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a, a context on how much climate finance is flowing at the moment to, um, the, um, to mitigation in the agriculture sector. These are our uh, new numbers from Climate Policy Initiative on global flows of climate finance in 2015-16. Annual flows um, amounted to 410 billion US dollars of new investment to address climate change in mitigation and adaptation. It's worth noting that 93% of the finance um, that we have tracked here is going to mitigation, only 5% to adaptation. This is a function of the, the data that we have available, but also to some extent a reflection of the, the reality. Two thirds of what we track is private finance, one third public, and 80% is domestic, which means that it's finance raised and spent in the same country, which is, really underlines the importance of domestic enabling policy environments and um, uh, ecosystem for enabling um, private investments, which I think is, is, will be a, a theme that we'll, we will talk about today. Moving to uh, the next slide, um, I mentioned that 93% of the finance that we track is on mitigation, but a very small amount is going to the land use sectors and indeed to agriculture. So we don't have any uh, good data available on um, private finance um, going towards the agricultural sector. This view that you see here is just on the public side. Public mitigation 
um, finance going to agriculture amounted to um, 700 million US dollars in 2015, 0.7 billion. That's only half of percentage of public mitigation finance that's going to agriculture at the moment. On the adaptation side, if we move to the next slide, it's a little bit more positive. We have 3.2 billion US dollars um, in 2015 of public finance going to agriculture um, and, and, and to adaptation, however. Moving to the next slide again. Um, so we see that there's only um, about uh, half a billion of um, finance going to um, agriculture uh, and to mitigation in the agricultural sector. The opportunity, though, has been estimated to be huge. Alpha, beta figures that are presented here, and sorry, are too small for you to show, to see here, um, estimate that needs um, of investment per year are about 320 billion US dollars in food and agriculture. These are op opportunities that they have estimated um, related to implementation of the sustainable development goals. So the question is, how are we going to seize this opportunity and why do we have so little um, public finance going towards um, mitigation in the agricultural sector at the moment? If we can move to the next slide, please. The Climate Policy Initiative a few years ago started a new public-private initiative called the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. This is a public-private public initiative that aims to identify develop and launch new sustainable finance instruments and mechanisms to drive billions through to mitigation and adaptation. It's already managed to raise 1 billion US dollars for 25 new innovative financing mechanisms in the first um, two years. And we do have a couple of instruments that focus on agriculture. Um, we've been working with F3 Life, Mark, on climate smart, a climate smart lending platform, which you'll hear more from him about. Um, we also have an instrument in our Brazil lab, which is a cattle ranching, climate smart cattle ranching um, mechanism, um, similar to, to what um, um, Mark is developing in terms of conditional finance on um, sustainable uh, ranching practices. If we We'll stay on this slide just for a second. So this initiative is, is funded by the UK, US, um, German, Dutch governments, as well as several philanthropic um, institutions. And it really draws on um, the network of lab members that are involved from different um, development finance institutions, donors, um, developing countries. Um, FNRWA is, is part of the lab as well. They um, support the instruments that are selected to go through the lab um, and um, help us to develop really solid business cases that are investable by the end of the process. Just to give you one example of an instrument, if you can move to the next slide, please. From our Brazil lab, um, this focuses on um, mitigation in the agricultural sector in relation to energy use by um, agricultural cooperatives, and it aims to promote um, distributed energy generation. It does that in two ways, um, by having pay-for-use contracts, which um, remove the high upfront costs of installing energy um, for the agricultural cooperatives, and also a two-part um, payment uh, for performance structure, which means that payments are, are fixed and variable depending on the, the energy performance. This reduces the risk um, for the, the agricultural cooperatives. So this is now going into pilot phase in the south of Brazil um, for nine agricultural cooperatives with 23 megawatts of, of wind in Rio Grande do Sud and will be 21, 20, 62 million uh, US dollars investments and, and will find high energy savings, savings on energy bills for the agricultural cooperatives. So that's just to give you one example um, from, from our innovation lab of where um, we are trying to help to sort of uh, scale up um, innovative financing mechanisms and, and finance that's going to agriculture um, and mitigation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
Thank you, Angela. And now we'll go to Gabriela Weber de Moraes. So thank you, Lini. Um, yes, uh, I'm so I'm Gabriella, as Lini introduced, and uh, I'm representing here Finance in Motion. We are impact uh, asset management, impact investor asset management, and I'm going to be talking about one of the funds that we are devised, which is the Eco Business Fund, and I'm going to explain to you a bit how we have how we are crafting our approach to invest in uh, sustainable cattle farming. Uh, yes, so as you know, probably here the audience is very well versed that traditional livestock um, production has several impacts on the environment and at the same time it has a very important uh, presence in the economy. So it provides jobs to more than one billion people and it's important in Latin America where the Eco Business Fund uh, is investing. It's important. It's important because it's uh, almost half of percent, uh, half of the the agriculture GDP in Latin America, and when we are talking here, we are talking about cattle farming within the lives, livestock sector, which is the one which has the major impact on environment. So, what's the the Eco Business Fund? The Eco Business Fund uh, was founded in 2014, actually, uh, f exactly three years uh, ago. And it, the concept was developed by the German Development Bank, K KFW, and together with Conservation International and also Finance in Motion. Uh, the aim of the fund was precisely to invest, promote business that contributes to biodiversity conservation. So we wanted to increase the role of the private sector in biodiversity conservation. And for doing so, we selected four sectors to invest which are agriculture, forestry, uh, tourism, and fisheries. And the idea uh, is basically, it, it has uh, expanded. So biodiversity is still very important, but it goes beyond biodiversity only. Also to increase sustainable practices in the sector and also climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, the, as I said, the region so far is Latin America, and we have been focused very much on, um, on biodiversity-rich countries. And we do, how we do this? We do through two ways. One is direct investments, which we haven't yet uh, started with the Eco Business Fund, but also through direct, indirect investments. So we select partner institutions, uh, financial institutions in this region, which share the same values with us and we invest through them. So we reach the final, the final sub-borrowers through uh, the financial institutions. Uh, thus far, we do this, this in two ways. One is through investing in business that already have sustainability certifications, so Rainforest Alliance, uh, Global Gap, and so forth. And the, others is, uh, the other way is to establish a green list in which we select what kind of activities, what kind of, of, of uh, investments want to, we want to make. Uh, so far, uh, we have been investing more in agriculture. That's the main uh, part of the, um, accounts for most of the portfolio so far. And we are uh, starting to craft our approach to, to, uh, to invest in livestock production. And since the, the deforestation and, inf uh, I mean, biodiversity in general is very important to the fund, uh, in addition to the regular procedures that we have, what we demand the financial institutions to have, we have additional, uh, ad additional requirements for investing in livestock production. So these requirements I'm going to talk a bit about, but it's in the next slide. And this is the approach. So before we, we start investing in one, one, one uh, start investing in cattle farming with a, a financial institution, the first thing we want to establish is uh, the, the, the safeguards. So first of all, we are not investing in any, in any business that's going to be in a um, protected area, IUCN category 1 to 3, with some uh, restrictions in IUCN category uh, 4 to 6. And uh, we also set a 
cut-off date, so there cannot be any deforestation uh, by, by the client after 2005. Uh, also here, uh, the idea is, and it's precisely where we are now, we are testing uh, providers of satellite images so that we can collect this data. Once we have collected this data, we are, we are uh, testing this in currently in Nicaragua. So we have five, um, eight, sorry, uh, clients where we are testing. And then we, we are moving to the next steps. The next step would be to categorize the clients and this categorization involves seeing what they are doing and if it matches the activities that we have in the, in the green list. What kind of activities we, we are selecting for livestock production. These are civil pastoral systems, uh, improved nutrition, uh, waste management, which is also important in terms of climate mitigation, and so forth. And then after selecting and seeing which clients have, uh, want to improve their practice, so they are not uh, contributing to deforestation and they are improving their practice, then we are going to have this third component, which is the, 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 the monitoring of no, no deforestation compliance throughout the life cycle of the loan. So here is just one example of, the, of one, one satellite image that we are testing. And this is the current stage. We, we have now this pilot going on in Nicaragua, and uh, the next year probably is going to be our first investment, which, is, which are going to, to be in Panama. This is just one example of kind of data we are looking at the, the, the clients when we are doing the categorization. And finally, we have here also what we understand to be a, a sustainable livestock production and how we want to contribute. So it's not that the clients, they are going to have all these practices in one, uh, in one farm, but actually that we want to support them with this transition. So we are making sure we are not contributing to the deforestation and we want to enhance their practice in sustainable cattle farming. I think that's it. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take questions after all of the speakers. And next I'd like to introduce Mark Ellis-Jones from F3 Life. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Ellis-Jones and I run a company called F3 Life. Um, and in partnership with uh, the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance at CPI Financial Access, uh, a Dutch company which designs credit scoring tools for smallholder farmers, and IUCN, we are the climate smart lending platform, which aims to, to generate climate smart lending deals. Um, a very brief introduction to what F3 Life does. I think this audience will no doubt be very familiar with uh, the challenges faced by, by uh, smallholder agriculture um, around reduced yields associated with climate change um, uh, and uh, increased number of weather shocks um, re resulting in crop failure. Um, What's often overlooked is the impact that that will have on uh, the institutions lending to smallholder farmers, both by way of reduced smallholder bankability, um, uh, a lowered ability of, of smallholder farmers to take loans, um, and secondly, increased credit default risk. Um, and by way of, of, of anecdote, we speak to a lot of uh, chief credit officers, uh, chief executive officers at lending institutions in, in Africa, and we know that they're all considering, if haven't already, started pulling credit lines to, to smallholder farmers because of weather shock. Um, that's obviously quite a concern in terms of uh, 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 food security uh, in, in those regions. Um, but the big question we have is, can we link uh, the mitigation benefits of improved agriculture uh, through increased carbon sequestration soils uh, to climate-related financial risk? Um, what is climate smart lending? Uh, uh, this is the F3 life system. Uh, um, it consists of uh, five key steps. The first is that when a farmer signs a loan agreement, they also sign a land management agreement, stipulating how they have to manage their land to increase resilience to climate change and increase sequestration of carbon to soils. The second step is that they have to implement the measures uh, that are required under their loan agreement. And I'll give you a sort of uh, a, a clear example of what I mean by that on the next slide. Um, they implement those measures as they repay their loan. Um, and then our systems are used to verify that the farmer uh, client is in compliance with those environmental management measures. Uh, the fourth step is that we translate uh, verification of implementation into a score 
which is provided back to the lender um, for incorporation into their credit scorecard or credit scoring algorithm. And that leads uh, to uh, reduced credit default risk uh, uh, and increased uh, smallholder bankability, or, or is designed to. This is an example of a climate smart credit product designed for a particular agroecological context in Kenya, um, where, uh, and, and as you look at this slide, bear in mind that, that loan amounts can change, interest rates can change, and the conservation requirements require, uh, associated with the loan can change. But just by way of example, uh, access to a $20 loan required uh, completion of a training, access to a $40 loan required planting of one grass contour strip uh, 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 on the farmer's land to act as a barrier to soil erosion, uh, to access an $80 loan, the farmer had to plant multiple grass strips on their land. Um, and then in the subsequent loans, the farmer had to reinforce those uh, grass contour strips with tree seedlings, um, and then to access the higher loans, that, that system needed to be so well established and then thriving. Um, this is a, an adaptation benefit to the farmer uh, um, in that it should result in increased income, both by way of you know, holding nutrients on the farmland and uh, reducing avoided costs associated with, with, with weather shock. Um, there's also a carbon sequestration or mitigation benefit to this. And really, uh, under some sort of land practice management or land management approaches, um, you, know, you can target uh, a sequestration potential of eight tons of CO2 uh, per hectare per year. Um, the value proposition, or you know, the question as to why a bank would employ this approach, um, is that it's designed to, to alongside increasing the, the farm yield for the farmer, um, reduce the credit default risk uh, associated with lending to that farmer, um, and increase the debt service coverage ratio of, of, of the farming client, which basically means that because they're earning more, they can afford to take and repay more debt. Um, embedded in our approach is the idea of environmental interest rates. Um, we acknowledge that the sort of the work done by farmers uh, is, is a way of restoring natural capital. Um, and when, uh, when a farmer takes a loan, uh, they, they manage financial capital, and they, they, they pay an interest on that, which is, which is financial interest. Um, what we've observed is that you know, when, when natural capital is used to, to create a profit, um, it can be run down, uh, and therefore restoration activity is, is, is needed to sort of keep the system or its productivity in check. Um, and we style that as, as environmental interest, and we think it needs to be in balance with the financial interest, so the restoration or the, or the maintenance of the natural capital needs to be in balance with, with, with what is taken out of the system. Um, we're working towards sort of methodology that will help us sort of precisely measure that, that interest rate or define that interest rate. But if there's anybody in the audience who, uh, who has some expertise in that, we'd be very happy to talk to you. Um, the Climate Smart Lending approach that F3 Life developed is being pushed now by the Climate Smart Lending Platform partners. Um, and the Climate Smart Lending Platform aims to bring together the types of capital that are required to, to extend uh, credit provision to smallholder farmers. Um, uh, together with tool providers such as F3 Life, but others as well who provide tools for, for climate smart lending, um, such as insurance providers, uh, and link those tools and that capital to local lenders who then on loan uh, agricultural credit to smallholder farmers on climate smart terms. Um, we're, we're scaling up in three stages. We're currently developing projects in Ghana, in Ghana Kenya, uh, and Rwanda. Um, uh, and are aiming to grow the number of farmers participating uh, in, in climate smart credit schemes to 45,000 over the next three years. Um, and that is the, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for, 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 for listening. Next, next we'll have Alex Molisa from Fonera. Uh, good morning. Uh, as stated, uh, my name is Alex Mulisa, and um, uh, I work with the Fund for Environment and Climate Change, which is a national fund for Rwanda. And um, uh, that's a map of Rwanda. Uh, one wonders why I put a map of my country there. I don't know why it's skipping. Uh, how do I go back? Yeah. yeah um, simple reason is. Uh, the climate relevance, both adaptation and mitigation. Uh, Rwanda is a very small country, highly populated, um, and uh, it, it has a hilly landscape, extensively hilly landscape. And uh, because of that, 
uh, we have extensive soil erosion. Uh, patterns are changing for the onset of rain, and these days uh, rain intensity has uh, really gone up. And uh, that bodes well for uh, the uh, soil erosion that we talked about. Now, um, the other thing on uh, the human factor is the fact that uh, over 80 percent of Rwandans depend on subsistence agriculture. Uh, I guess it's typical of most of the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and because of that, uh, agro inputs are intensely used. Uh, and the, uh, the second communication uh, to the UNFCCC, uh, studies indicated that over 80 uh, percent of the greenhouse gases actually come from agriculture. So that is the direct relevance. Uh, the other issue is the fact that studies have indicated the uh, role of climate change, uh, the cost of climate change and the impact on the GDP itself. Um, and uh, the numbers are out there. Uh, Rwanda needs about $300 million every year to just address climate change. Yes, thanks. Um, now, based on what uh, I've talked about, we came up with a green growth and climate resilience strategy. And it has 14 programs of action. And um, the programs of action are all outlined there. Uh, but two of them are within agriculture. Um, and then there's one of them that is uh, on forestry uh, and agroforestry. Um, part of the reason is because uh, we use uh, as well, intensely biomass as a source of energy, and uh, that, of course, is linked with uh, the soil erosion uh, and is linked with the mitigation aspect in uh, agriculture. Now, as a result of that, we came up with a fund for environment and climate change to be able to address uh, all those uh, issues that have been talked ab talking about. Uh, this is the design features, uh, but what is uh, important is when you look at um, uh, wh what the fund intends to do uh, for the future is how to crowd in private sector resources within the fund. So we have been successful in terms of mobilizing public sector. Up to now we have been able to mobilize around 90 million predominantly uh, from bilaterals and multilaterals in terms of private uh, investments. Uh, but the fund is designed in a way uh, that uh, private sector should increasingly become a key player in uh, the climate uh, space in Rwanda, just as it is for most other development. That is the decision Rwanda has taken based on the fact that we want to become a middle-income country. And um, we are convinced that there is no where in the world where a country has emerged into a middle-income country without the significant role of a private sector. So likewise, the fund must also uh, attract private investments. And uh, that is where uh, public, se public sector resources come in to be able to de-risk the initial investments, particularly to crowd in the private sector. And some things have been happening so far, uh, as we will see. The fund has been in operation for the last five years. Uh, we have been able to uh, support projects up to uh, 32 projects. And uh, this is just an example uh, where you see the uh, green uh, labels. Uh, that is primarily most of the funding that has gone in agriculture to deal with sustainable land management. Uh, when you look at uh, the private sector inputs, it has been pre predominantly in things to do with the, the construction sector uh, because the construction sector is growing significantly. Uh, it's in the energy sector. But most of the uh, investments so far, uh, close to around 70%, have been in the sustainable land management, forestry, uh, and forestation projects. Uh, so this is how critical agriculture is uh, both from the adaptation standpoint as well as from the mitigation standpoint. A number of um, uh, uh, things have come. I talked of subsistence agriculture being predominant. And um, the fact that 
uh, small scale agriculture uh, or small holders uh, uh, benefiting from public sector resources uh, has not really translated into the kind of transformation we are looking for. So the strategy is to see how we can crowd in, uh, we can bring on board uh, uh, private sector and um, the smallholder, uh, rather the smart uh, uh, lending platform is one of the mechanisms we are considering. Right now there is a proposal uh, that we are looking at to understand uh, some of the ways in which uh, private sector can be brought on board to, de to uh, deal with smallholder farmers primarily in terms of investments, uh, cooperatives, uh, a movement that is coming up. The question is how do we use the private sector resources, the public sector resources to be able to bring in uh, public, uh, private resources. Uh, these are some of the challenges but also present opportunities. Uh, we can see the funding streams. I talked of the predominant uh, resources coming from private sector, rather from the public sector. Um, but one of the things that is critical is how do we, uh, uh, again, uh, understand the markets, uh, use screening methods to be able to uh, target private, sec private sector investments flowing into smallholder farmers. Um, the other aspect we have to look at is the synergistic aspect. Predominantly, agriculture is uh, uh, adaptation-driven, uh, intense floods, uh, but the question is how do we uh, bring in, uh, uh, ad to address adaptation with a view to even uh, benefiting from the, uh, the, the linkages, the cost, as cross-cutting as they talk about. And that will require the multi-sectoral consideration where forestry, agriculture have to work together to be able to realize the benefits. In Rwanda, even when you talk of, um, uh, when you talk of uh, energy itself, soil erosion causes irritation, and if watersheds are not protected, uh, even as a, a benefit in terms of uh, sustainable land management, uh, we are losing on uh, the ability to even uh, generate energy that is so critical for manufacturing and transitioning. So there's a whole range of um, uh, linkages in terms of the co-benefits that we can derive uh, even as we focus on agriculture by itself. Um, I believe the, uh, the first uh, uh, slide showed about the partnerships. We have global green growth uh, as partners in terms of uh, supporting capacity development. Uh, we have DFID, of course, that has invested uh, in, in the fund. We have KFW, uh, a range of uh, uh, partners that have worked with us to be able to come this far. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ash Sharma from the NAMA facility. Okay, thank you and uh, good, good morning, or good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Ash Sharma, thank you. Um, I represent a, uh, a publicly funded climate uh, fund uh, which manages 260 million euros worth of uh, financing from the UK, uh, Germany, uh, Denmark and the European Union. Um, the NAMA facility uh, is really aiming to be a vehicle for uh, learning and disseminating best practices. So for this reason, we're very grateful to be here uh, and to share some of our early lessons learned with, uh, with all of you. If we move to the first slide, you can just see a good uh, uh, a map here which shows the kinds of projects that we're working with. I'm very pleased to say that in terms of our portfolio, we support 21 projects. Uh, around 20% of our portfolio relates to agriculture and agribusiness, uh, which includes, for example, a, uh, a beef uh, sector supply chain project uh, in Brazil. It's a very interesting program. Just started uh, a Thai rice nama, uh, a um, Costa Rican coffee nama, and I, I believe you can sample some of the uh, uh, nama coffee at the German pavilion. So please do take advantage of that. Okay, so in terms of what we're hoping to, to achieve, our, our focus is really on transformation. And the objective here is to shift a sector 
uh, in a country towards a more sustainable and irreversible low carbon pathway. And this is something that should happen much faster than the business as usual scenario uh, of technological development. Trying to achieve this, this level of transformational change with the level of grants that we provide, which is up to 20 million euros, uh, which is not insignificant, but in terms of uh, trying to, to make a, uh, a dent in some of these sectors, does require a lot of leveraging. And the small graph you'll see there uh, relates to the sorts of uh, financial leveraging that we hope to achieve. We're looking at every euro that we, we provide uh, leveraging seven euros of both public and private financing. And actually we would like to see more of the private financing. So we are in a situation where some of this money is being used uh, to um, leverage more public funding. Uh, and of course we want to move, move beyond that. Uh, we want to, as, as has been mentioned before, we want to uh, crowd in uh, private sector funding. We seek minimum concessionality, particularly in many of the middle income countries that we work in. Um, and you can see here from our next slide uh, that uh, there are a number of financial mechanisms that, that are being used in, uh, in the programs that we work with. Uh, finance is very much uh, at the core of what we what we try to uh, to to achieve, along with pipeline building uh, and developing more uh, bankable uh, projects, projects that can be funded uh, and taken forward. So we've seen that many of the early programs that we worked with, they did uh, focus very much on uh, targeted investment grants, and we're trying to move away from that towards more more leveraging. And you can see, for example, uh, the Brazil project that we have uh, in development is looking at a first loss guarantee program to work with, with ranchers, but also uh, with other actors along the supply chain. Um, and we're, there we can see there's a possibility of leveraging uh, of up to 15 to 20 times for each euro that we put forward. Um, I'll just make some, some comments, apologies for the dense text there, please don't read it all. Um, but uh, what we've learned in terms of the business models uh, for the uh, projects that we've supported really is that in order to have a convincing business case, i.e. to get funding from, from our, our uh, instrument, uh, the things that we found is that it's very important to have, uh, to make clear the economic uh, and other motivations of each uh, group. And this can be producers, suppliers, end users, and that's often not adequately covered in, in what we've seen. Uh, we have to describe the incentives that will change behavior, uh, to go into some details around the capital investment flows. Um, I mean, some of these are very obvious things if you work in, in, in finance and, and are developing projects, but uh, often, the, these issues are not well well uh, addressed. One other issue I would mention here is the affordability. Um, the The funding that we provide is transitional, and uh, the new technology that uh, that is being implemented has to be taken forward within the affordability of that target group, um, or a concept for sustainable financing uh, of uptake after that should be well well described. Um, we often have business cases, for example, which are built on uh, capital cost subsidies. These are rarely viable in our, in our view. They also offer a, a very low leveraging uh, opportunity. Uh, where they are uh, relevant, they should only be a very minor aspect of CapEx. They should avoid market uh, distortions and uh, they should employ uh, transparent selection uh, criteria. Um, we also have some concerns about straightforward demonstration projects. We've seen a lot of these. I think, again, one has to show and demonstrate how uh, replicable and scalable uh, these can really be uh, going forward, uh, particularly uh, after the first projects have been, have been implemented. Uh, how, how can these move forward in, in a in a real life uh, uh, financing condition. Uh, just to 
to sum up, really, um, in terms of financial sustainability, we see this as a, as a critical aspect of what we look at. A lot of our early projects wanted uh, investment grants, uh, also short-term instruments that can be um, funded by, uh, by a grant facility like ours, like uh, interest rate subsidies. We believe that it's better to look, in terms of sustain sustainability, at more permanent sources to redirect these financial flows going forward. So, for example, uh, employing public sector budgets, taxes, um, uh, guarantee instruments domestically, working with, with uh, local institutions uh, wherever uh, possible, contributions from private households where appropriate, uh, and industry. Uh, we've seen that in some of the projects, for example, in the, the beef sector. Um, the funding concept needs to be temporary with a clear phase in and phase out. Um, and while we focus on, on uh, financing, it's important to understand that there are a lot of opportunities for policy uh, reforms, regulatory changes, uh, which can be funded through technical assistance, where again you have a very high level of of uh, leveraging uh, for the funding that you're uh, offering. I think a general comment I would make uh, in conclusion is really the role of public fin financing in this really is around de-risking investments, uh, building project pipelines, uh, and uh, we see ourselves really as a, as a test bed for some of these more uh, innovative financing instruments. So I'll stop there. Uh, I will, if you just indulge me one moment, uh, say that uh, on Monday we have a side event uh, at which hopefully we will make a very interesting announcement uh, uh, for the future. So thank you very much. Please. Thank you, Ash. So now we have a few minutes for clarifying questions, and may I ask that you state your name and affiliation? I'll take a round of three questions. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, Charles Kaviswa from Uganda. And uh, my question goes to uh, Gabriela. I'm just wondering if the, the modern eco business fund is applicable to agro, the, uh, the pastoralists, pastoral communities. The model you presented, is it applicable to the pastoral communities? the Eco Business Fund. Then I have one for Mark. Uh, I, 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 from the chain presented, I did not see the linkage with the, uh, the risky disaster risks which may affect the farmers. So do you have some uh, linkages with the risk insurance or something like that? Because it is very important. Then lastly, to Nama, I'm wondering if it is micro focus or it is only macro because what we've presented is big big businesses. Thanks, and may I just ask the people limit um, themselves to one question, please go ahead. My name is Kopetz, I'm from the World Bioenergy Association. I have one question to Gabriela. You spoke about uh, cattle farming in Brazil. My question is, one main reason for greenhouse gas emissions of cattle farming are the methane emissions from the manure management, and you could uh, avoid these emissions by building biogas plants and use the manure to produce electricity or heat or whatever. And is it possible to finance biogas plants within this program? Okay, and the third question? I'm Jafet Muli from Kenya, Trokia. Uh, just again to Gabriela on the livestock management. Uh, you said that, uh, we, we, of course, we know that uh, there's a lot of emissions when it comes to livestock. What is the difference, different in your approach that is reducing the emissions? Maybe in one statement to know how you're doing it. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will see if I if I got all the questions. We are focusing more now on on middle size and large uh, size uh, cattle uh, farmers in Latin America. That's the current focus, and it also has a, a, a objective of what we are discussing before of leveraging 
and uh, having a scale. This has been really uh, something that we have been working on on all the funds that we advise. And this is also the, the, the mandate that we have from, from the investors. So in this sense, this would be our focus. Regarding the second question, yes, we are also financing biodigesters, for example. So we are also concerned about the energy generation part. I don't know if I got your question right. So it's one of the important parts, waste management, uh, how we can improve in the farms because of, of, of uh, uh, nitrous oxide. oxide. Yeah. So it's, it's an important aspect for us as well. And the third question, uh, pastoral systems. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, as well, this is also part of um, our understanding. Uh, I think this was also one question that Lini had. Uh, we don't have, because we are not financed yet, we don't have the, the impact of this, but we know uh, how much, uh, how, how uh, yeah, about the gains related uh, to this practice. So yeah. I think it also uh, relates a bit to what you said about technical assistance and uh, how we can actually uh, uh, raise awareness of, of the gains, not only in terms of environmental gains and, and in terms of emissions, but also how it imp imp uh, the positive impact it has in the management practice and therefore in their profit as well. Um, this was a question about um, <coughs> uh, smallholder farmers uh, risk insurance um, it's, a, it's a useful question um, and although F3 life provides a sort of a very defined solution um, around uh, credit scoring and, and including climate criteria in in ag or in farmers credit scores we are exploring uh, partnerships with insurance providers um, whereby information that we supply, around farmers' adoption of climate smart agricultural practices result in a, results in a reduction of the premium that they are required to pay for for that insurance. Um, and that's quite exciting because uh, you know, one of the barriers to wide-scale uptake of, of, I guess, weather index insurance, parametric insurance products has been the cost, you know, typically looking at sort of 5 7% of, of loan value. Um, if smallholder farmers are doing the equivalent of wearing a, a seatbelt, uh, and reducing their, uh, their risk, then there, there should be a, a compensation by way of reduction of premium to them. Ash, did you want to come? Okay, thank you for your, for your question. Uh, certainly, we, we don't aim to support large, uh, large businesses. Um, uh, first of all, they don't need the, the, uh, the finance. It's not an appropriate use of uh, public funding in any case. Um, but there are cases, for example, where we will provide technical support to uh, companies which are involved in uh, processing, for example, in, in, in the beef sector. Um, but the majority of our, our programs work, tend to work with uh, SMEs, um, for example, in, uh, the, um, in, in the rice sector, uh, in Thailand, and also uh, small and medium-sized coffee processors and grinders in, in, uh, in Costa Rica. We have time for one more round of questions, three questions. So, hello. Uh, my name is Alejandra. I, I'm from Colombia. In Colombia, most of the farmers are uh, small, and I would like to know how can we make sure that finance is reaching smallholders farmers and not just the larger farmers? Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm late. So, uh, I'm Tani Pongondwana from Gauteng province in South Africa. I, I just, I just need you to, if if you have considered this, now we are talking about a futuristic farm or the farm of the future, uh, and I'm not sure whether some of the instruments uh, that you have do fund that because as we we put our money, we must consider the future and make sure that whatever the 
the farmers are doing, it's something that will make sure that to reduce the adverse effect of climate change. But anyone can respond to that. I just need to, to get a sense. Thank you. Great questions, both. Uh, a third question? All right. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. I'm from Vietnam because I see so far most questions from, come from Africa. And uh, I just want to ask Mark and other uh, speakers I will follow uh, in, in the later stage of this workshop that uh, I'm very interested in your model. And uh, I'm just wondering how, what is the criteria for farmers uh, that you select to join your uh, activities and also do you intend to help them to link their, uh, your activities with the farmers to the carbon market uh, to get some income and how do you work with the banks because in your presentations you not mention so much about how you uh, work with the bank. Thank you. And, and also the last one is that for the MRV in your five steps, how can you link uh, for the MRV procedures or credit procedures into the MRV of, at the national level. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we, we only have a couple of minutes to address this. Um, if you want to take uh, any of the panelists who'd like to address any of these questions, please go ahead. Anybody? Mark? Should I deal with that direct question first? Um, uh, what criteria do we use to assess which farmers can join? Well, actually, that's, that's not up to us. We only provide the, the designs for the Climate Smart Credit product and the tools for monitoring the farmers are in compliance with the requirements of their loan. So it's very much left to the third party uh, lenders that we work with um, who they select. Um, it sort of, that question crosses the other question about how do you make sure that smallholder farmers also benefit from this? Well, there's, there's an issue here because um, you know, at the moment, only the top, you know, only sort of 15 to 20 percent of, uh, of smallholder farmers are considered to be conventionally uh, bankable. Um, and that means that sort of a very large percentage, 75 to 80 percent, um, are not going to be able to access, you know, they will benefit from accessing working capital facilities, for example. Um, and, and, and that's a, you know, un undoubtedly a real concern. We've tried to address that with a, a different product line. Um, and if you'd like to have a look at it online, you can go to the website greenfi.org. Um, and, and see the sort of the product that we've developed for that, but that re relies on on capital grants and isn't a isn't a sort of financially sca sca a scalable solution in the way that F3 Life offers. Um, we haven't thought about linking to carbon markets. We don't see a bankable sort of business there, or sort of you know, a, a business case for, for you know, integration with carbon markets at this point. You know, we we definitely look at it if that changed. Um, and linking to you know national level MRVs, you know that's something that I think we could benefit from some advice as to how to how to how to do. Um, and the final question was about adaptation. Uh, our system uh, very much is geared towards you know, transitioning farmers or providing the incentives to farmers to adopt uh, more more climate smart agricultural practices, which will assist in their their adaptation and means that they continue they can continue to benefit from accessing working capital facilities. Um, and you know. There are some mitigation or sequestration benefits associated with that, but you know, we've, we've typically sort of seen this as a, a sort of an adaptation-based business with mitigation benefits rather than the other way around. So I'm afraid we do have to move on, but we now are addressing the farm of the future because this next section is about the future, the vision for the next step. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lizzie Teague, who's the first of our two discussants. She'll speak for three minutes and tell us what needs to happen. Thank you, Lenny. Good afternoon. My name is Lizzie Teague and I work with Root Capital. Root Capital is a lender that provides loans and business training to small and medium-sized agricultural enterprises in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Root Capital borrowers range from coffee cooperatives in Guatemala or Peru to macadamia nut traders and processors in Kenya to sorghum traders in Ghana. The common element we look for is that these businesses source from smallholder farmers and are having some sort of positive impact on their community and on the environment. Just to give you a sense of numbers, our average borrower is working with around 1,000 farmers, and these farmers are generally managing between two and five hectares of land. Our average borrower has around $1 million in revenue, and our average loan to these businesses is around $650,000. 
Since we started in 1999, Root Capital has lent over $1 billion to 660 businesses around the world, representing 1 million smallholder farmers. So Linny asked us to speak to the path forward in three minutes <laughs> to what is needed to scale mitigation, finance, and agriculture. I wanted to echo a thread mentioned by all the speakers today that mitigation finance in the agricultural sector often requires a blended finance approach, mixing commercial capital with targeted public funding or subsidy to cover higher cost and risk for investors and technical assistance for investees. This has certainly been our experience with mitigation loans to agricultural enterprises, at least if we want to reach smallholders and at least if we want to operate at scale. So Root Capital's mitigation lending to date has focused on capital expenditure loans for coffee farm replanting, which currently make up about 10% of our $90 million portfolio, or for clean technology investments, often at the business level. In both cases, Root Capital needed loan guarantees to cover the higher risk and grants to cover technical assistance for our borrowers. We couldn't and wouldn't price the cost of risk or technical assistance into our loans. Our borrowers and their farmers simply wouldn't have been able to afford the, the resulting interest rates. So recently, we've started to see more talk about the need for blended finance for climate action, which we think is encouraging. But we all seem a bit stuck in the talking stage, with relatively few mitigation investments actually going out the door. At least in the smallholder sector, one challenge has been finding the right flavors of blended capital to resource these mitigation loans. Not surprisingly, it's hard to find concessionary capital. It's hard to find subsidy. And, and frankly, we don't blame funders for being wary because financial institutions often don't give funders good visibility into the financial and impact returns of different mitigation investments. As an outside donor or investor, it can be really hard to distinguish good below market investing with mitigation co-benefits from simply bad financial investing. So one idea to scale mitigation finance and agriculture is for financial institutions to open their books and share data on expected and most importantly, when available, realized mitigation and financial returns. Then investors and donors can shop around and see what mitigation really costs in different sectors and geographies using different financial products at different scales. And they can decide where they wanna place their capital and how they think it should be blended. My hope is that transparency will help attract more capital to mitigation and agriculture because it will build trust among financial institutions, donors, and investors, while hopefully sparking some healthy competition in finding the most efficient ways to address this problem in different scenarios. Root Capital recently shared the tools that we're developing to manage the financial and impact returns of our general agricultural lending. But ours, this is only one fund's first crack at the challenge and is not specific to mitigation impacts. So we think a much broader effort is needed to really get a sense of what capital is needed to achieve our mitigation goals and to together build scalable models to address this challenge. And after seeing the speakers present today, I think we're um, off to a good start. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lizzie. Great. And Juan Chang from the Green Climate Fund. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, just uh, very briefly, I have a few minutes only. Uh, my name is Juan Chang, I work for the Green Climate Fund. So probably some of you already know how the GCF operates, but uh, basically GCF um, has uh, some uh, criteria in order to approve projects. And there are six criteria that we use for approving projects, which are impact potential, paradigm shift potential, sustainable development potential, needs of the recipient, efficiency and effectiveness, and country ownership. So what I was hearing during these presentations is that all these initiatives cover all these criteria, and this is very encouraging to see, because at the moment, GCF has approved around more than 900 million US dollars in uh, land use sector projects. Uh, and most of, in most cases, these proposals that we have been receiving rely largely on, on public sector investments. And in most cases, the, the preferred instrument is, is grant instrument, 
But then we always struggle uh, in the discussion saying how do you assure sustainability of these investments in the land use sector if you are only relying on grants. So what we have uh, here in this presentation is there is innovation and there is an opportunity. And what I heard, and I took note of very interesting points, uh, use public sector for catalyzing private sector or de-risking private sector. That's very interesting and, and very encouraging to hear and that there are already initiatives going on that direction. Uh, also, very in interesting is that uh, looking into mitigation as an opportunity, uh, creating new instruments, financial instruments, uh, to, to address a problem, but at the same time find an opportunity. How, it was mentioned many times also today, uh, how in the process of addressing adaptation, you can also find a, a benefit for, for the farmers and, and increasing the livelihoods. So overall, uh, there is an, an interesting landscape going ahead. The initiatives are going. In, as a GCF, we really look forward to, to and encourage uh, having investments that look into this criteria has been described, triggering pri uh, private sector, using public sector to, to catalyze uh, private investments. Uh, something that the GCF is also looking at at the moment is the traceability of uh, deforestation-free commodities, which was also very interesting to hear. It's already ongoing. And there are already initiatives in many parts of the world but in order to get to this criteria that we call paradigm shift, there needs to be a, a more articulated and a probably a more strategic way to put together the instruments, the policies, and the financial that can come in order to, to get to these outcomes. Um, I think that's all I have for the moment. Thank you very much. All right. So now we have, uh, see, about 20 minutes uh, for a discussion with all of you. And I'm going to turn over to Fraser. Both Fraser and I will facilitate this. And this is an opportunity for you to put forward your vision and ask questions and for the panelists to also engage in the discussion. I'd love to know who's in the room. Um, how many people are... I know you're in the room. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't mean like that. Uh, uh, um, no, maybe you have a question. We'll come back to you. I'm not going to read this. No, um, who, who is with, uh, who's with government, who works with government? And um, private sector? Um, civil society? Any groups that I missed that somebody would like to shout out? Research. Research. I was not joking. Okay, that's quite a that's quite a mix across the board. Um, how many people would know what uh, blended finance is? That's not so many. But only about less than half. Uh, the word leverage, in terms of finance, so that's got places leveraging public money to um, to mobilise more private finance. Okay, so we see where we are. Now, um, where do you want to go from here, Lenny? We have one question, I think, to kick things off. Sure. Shoot. Not too hard now. <laughs> Bonjour. Je vais poser ma question en français. Euh, J'ai bien écouté, en fait, vos différentes interventions. Et donc, euh, j'aimerais poser une question, effectivement, sur la spécificité de l'agriculture en Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, vous savez très bien, j'ai bien suivi les, les finances dans le secteur de l'agriculture. Alors, en Afrique de l'Ouest, donc, euh, on a aussi l'agriculture familiale. Et just, I'm going to just ask, is there somebody that can, in a very ad hoc way, translate? <laughs> yeah. We have a volunteer here. Do you need to translate now, or can he finish? Yeah, go ahead and finish, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Euh, voilà, donc en Afrique de l'Ouest, effectivement, il y a l'agriculture euh, familiale. Et donc les financements dans le secteur agricole ici, s'agit-il effectivement des financements euh, de l'agro-industrie ou de l'agriculture euh, familiale Et comment est-ce que les petits agriculteurs en fait, euh, voilà, pourraient donc bénéficier de ces financements Est-ce qu'il y a déjà des mécanismes euh, et quelles sont les structures auxquelles ils, ils pourraient euh, éventuellement s'adresser Voilà, c'est ma question. Merci. Thank you very much. We have our translator here. <laughs> Thank you for stepping up. 
Yeah, no problem. So the question comes from someone from West Africa, saying that uh, asking the question whether all these mechanisms are geared toward agro industries, big large scale industries, or rather smallholders uh, in West Africa. We to talked about family, uh, yeah, small families uh, far of farmers, and um, mm. are these financial mechanisms? Uh, geared towards such uh, uh, yeah, structures. Uh. Let's keep it out there at the moment. Are there any other questions that just want to jump in? Uh, go ahead, please. And then here next. Uh, so next here. Oh, no. So I, I think now I have uh, uh, opportunities to address to NAMA facility and also to GCF. Uh, during the presentations, I see that uh, you mentioned a lot about the private sector. And uh, GCEP just uh, announced the private sector window for, uh, for countries to, pro uh, to, to submit their proposals. So can you, GCEP, update us on how many proposals uh, for the private window that you received? And uh, how many percent of uh, the proposals focus on uh, agriculture and adaptation uh, and uh, to both NAMA facility and uh, GCEF that uh, how many private sectors or companies, international groups that you have been successfully uh, involving them to uh, give fund to, to NAMA facilities and to GCEF. Thank you. And one more. There was a couple of other hands raised. I think uh, this lady. Thank you. Gabriela Burian here representing the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, Climate Smart Agriculture. My question is for Gabriela, for Ash, and for Mark. Our great presentation, how can we help you to leverage this process? What do you need to scale up those great initiatives? Thank you. And we'll take one more here while we're, while we're on. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Clyde Graham from Fertilizer Canada, the Association for uh, Fertilizer uh, Companies in Canada. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, you were asking questions of uh, who represents what. I'm just wondering of, of the people involved in finance, who's interested in working in terms of uh, with the fertilizer industry in terms of improving mitigation and outcomes? That's a good question. So one more while we're, while we're on the roll. I know the panel is itching to, uh, to jump on these. Okay, Victor Comoral from CIMIT in uh, Mexico. Um, more a comment. Um, what struck, struck me a little bit, and I'm a bit worried about that, is these, these are pieces of a puzzle that need to fit together a bit more. Mm. For example, the, um, the credit services for small farm, smallholder farmers that you described, uh, Mark, combination with index insurance and that, again, with things that really are attractive to farmers, just as an example of, of being a bit more comprehensive. Um, same with what you're doing in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, the, the, it, it should be about a more of a cycle. Agroforestry should play a role. I mean, there's, there's, it's not just the livestock value chain, right? It needs to be, if you want to incentivize, incentivize farmer behavior change, what are you doing there, really, apart from just providing mm. finance that may not be provided by a Nicaraguan bank because it's not there? Mm -hmm. yeah? Okay. So we're... This is good. I mean, we're getting to some meat on the bones, and that's really what we want. I want to zero in on Angela's statistic. 0.5% uh, of public finance is going to mitigation in agriculture. I mean, we, as you said, there are pieces of the jigsaw here. One speaker talked about the need to put all our data out there so that investors can analyze it and see where to address um, there was another comment about this sort of disaggregated and idiosyncratic approach to, to deals and how we need to increasingly, you know, get our ducks in a row and clarify how we're going to do this. So if the panel in responding to these questions could just jump on this question of what are the answers? How do we find a way forward here at COP23 on some of these huge challenges that we face in the context of the questions asked? 
So who wants to kick off? I think Alex Melissa has been very quiet there for a while. <laughs> so. um, I, I just uh, would speak from uh, my experience with the fund. Uh, when we started talking about uh, getting into the smallholder farmer space, uh, it seemed like a no-go zone. Uh, but I, I really think that um, it's a question, like most other things, of um, what ideas are needed for the smallholder farmers to go commercial. Um, I think for the most part, uh, Rwanda has been convinced that it is not public grants that are going to make a difference, both in the climate change and in the development. So the question is, how do we come up with the right kind of tools and the instruments and mechanisms that can bring on board uh, the uh, credit worthiness uh, of smallholder farmers, considering that 80% uh, of the people in agriculture, which, is, uh, which contributes right now to 33% of the economy, uh, how do we bring them on board? And uh, once we took that road, uh, we have seen, you know, the likes of Unilever uh, coming in the fold uh, to be able to provide uh, schemes. Uh, Wood Foundation, Wood Foundation is a, a British social enterprise uh, that is operating in that space. And what is really needed is uh, the mechanisms and the tools, and which is why the Climate Smart Lending Platform, uh, the, what Mark has been talking about, the F3 Life model, uh, is very uh, attractive to us. Um, and we are in the process of seeing how the public sector resources can actually de-risk investments and bring on board uh, smallholder farmers through cooperatives to be able to manage grant schemes. Uh, what is also interesting is that we have seen some banks that are now local banks that never even thought that would be possible coming on board. We have um, um, a, what we call Uruguay Opportunity Bank that is beginning to work with the cooperatives to provide the loan schemes for these kind of uh, farmers. Um, a question came through in terms of uh, how do we even address the farmer of the future. Uh, for us, tea and coffee are cash crops that generate revenue uh, for the country. And uh, there are so many farmers who have been doing it uh, in the wetland, so to speak. And right now, part of the studies have indicated that a transition to, uh, you know, uh, heat slopes is not only going to bring about soil stabilization, but it is actually the way to go in terms of uh, dealing with the future climate impacts. So these are co-benefits that can come from a careful uh, and deliberate uh, approach to working with the smallholder farmers and trying to increase knowledge and diversify mechanisms financial mechanisms that can allow them to begin, uh, you know, uh, investing themselves beyond just what the grants of the likes of Green Climate Fund can do. Matter of fact, one of the projects we have in the Green Climate Fund that we are working with is dealing with uh, this kind of thing. Uh, we have a loan scheme uh, that will provide a rolling mechanism for the smallholder farmers. Um, and um, it's on a pilot level, and uh, we believe that we are uh, going to be impacting uh, the future through uh, climate smart uh, lending platforms for smallholder farmers. Thank you very much. Alex, we have 10, 10 minutes left, so keep going. And anybody you know, you are allowed to jump in here with a yes but. Just uh, do that if you like. <laughs> 
So just a quickly, uh, as we had the question here, we are, we, I was mentioning first, we are already invested in crops and now we are preparing our approach to livestock production. But what you said, it, we are totally, uh, yeah, we are totally uh, convinced that agroforestry and these systems are important. So for example, in El Salvador, we have been working with um, shaded grown coffee under agroforestry systems. So we have been, this is why we are also not only working with sustainability certifications, but developing this green list approach to see what practice we would like to enhance. And also mentioning about the uh, small farmers, I also wanted to mention that most of our technical assistance we have been providing to the financial institutions on how they, they, they can tailor their approach. So although we are not investing directly in the cattle farming, in small holders, this we, we would like to see, as we are saying, the, com the commodities, deforestation free uh, supply chains, that they also start using these tools that we are using, uh, that we are planning to use, like the satellite images that they incorporate in their normal loan process, so that it also influences the, the small holders. And finally, regarding cooperation, I think this is a very good point because uh, basically we cannot we are all, the cooperation is essential i would say so we are we are already for example in touch with nestle in panama because they are working with milk production um there and supporting them to a transition to the market and adapt and we are very willing to work with the industry sector to cooperate and merge <laughs> i didn't touch anything <laughs> And to merge efforts so that it can also be, uh, yeah, mainstreamed. Lizzie, how would you achieve this uh, opening up all of the private financiers' data? Um, well, I think first of all, one one challenge and and one reason why I'm also wary to speak for the entire financial sector um, is that when we talk about finance, even when we're talking about impact investing in agriculture, you're looking at very different types of financial institutions that are doing very different types of things. So we are a debt lender. Um, we provide short-term loans. We're able to look at each loan and and look at the the financial returns in a way that's fairly straightforward. We're looking at interest revenue and fee revenue, and then we're able to compare that with the cost of making that loan, and then we're able to um, look at the expected impact using tools that we've developed ourselves. And so we went through the exercise of, of really just um, putting up on the board the, the cost of these loans relative to the impact. Um, I mean, it's very common in the financial sector that you look at the um, profit of an uh, investment relative to the cost, relative to the risk. Um, and so we basically tried to just introduce a third dimension to that, which is the impact, and graph that and see what came out. Um, and we were able to do that with the 2,000 loans that we've made over the last 15 years. And so that's the approach that we took, and that could be We've published um, several resources related to that, um, and that's been very enlightening for us and for our investors. But I think, um, you know, we want to prompt the conversation. But each organization, each institution, will need to find its own way. And I actually think, in the impact investing space, there's a very robust conversation around this. There's there's a lot of um, there's just a big effort to say, you know, we've been working in this space for 10, 15 years. How can we get better at showing the actual impact of what we do and comparing that to the cost? And so if you look at the GIN, which is the Global Impact Investor Network or other similar resources, there's a, there's a very large conversation happening. And I would um, really encourage folks in the climate space to, to look at that, to try to enter that space. I know many of us would be very interested in, in climate funders um, and climate action practitioners entering that space and learning together. And uh, Juan, there was a question again about information and data out of GCF. And what's your uh, perspective on this question? Yes, first of all, clarify that uh, it's not a new window of private sector. It's a private sector facility is uh, been constituted since the beginning. And we have been approving projects uh, uh, since 2015. In most of the portfolio of the private sector is on energy generation, mostly. In private sector, we haven't, in, sorry, in land use agriculture, we haven't seen much private sector investments at the moment. And that's, that's what I find very interesting in this panel, that there are already very interesting and innovative uh, opportunities for private sector engagement in the land use sector. What private sector has done recently is to launch a request for proposals for leveraging private sector capital, and we receive around 300 uh, proposals. 
are still are under review. So there was an, an initiative from this private sector facility that already exists. Um, I just wanted to highlight one aspect uh, that uh, Angela mentioned very in her interesting spaghetti slide, is that in many cases, that's actually one of the key issues that we see in our, uh, when we receive proposals. In some cases, it's not necessarily a lack of finance. Sometimes it's existing finance that is already ongoing in the sector that may need to drive a little bit, and that's where we see the, the additional need for, for finance that the climate finance can provide. The, clim the public funds that these uh, uh, climate institutions have, like the GCF, is gonna be very limited for what is needed in order to address climate change. And we see there is a great opportunity to link uh, already existing finance available, innovative mechanisms, and to find what is the maximum value that we can get with the limited public sources that we have in, in climate finance. So uh, we're in the closing minutes, and I know there are questions. Of course, you can stay afterwards, but I would like um, I would like the remaining panelists, um, Anna and Mark, and to to just a minute or a minute and a half each. Maybe start with Angela, and then yeah. I'll, I'll actually pass because I'll do a quick summary at the end. So. I'm not sure that's in the rules, but uh, okay, I'll let you. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think uh, we've discussed private sector engagement um, and uh, it's been a lot of discussion around uh, how, at least in, in, the, in, the, in the climate finance space, how to bring more domestic uh, actors into, in, into, the, into the game. And uh, I think there was a question around uh, how much pri international companies are involved. Most of our programs have domestic a focus on domestic uh, uh, companies, but that's just how it, how it works. We have no no problems working with international international com companies. But I think the, the the issue really I think is around financing and bringing uh, commercial financial institutions in country on board, because uh, you know we find that many of these programs, larger programs, don't move forward because they're reliant on multilateral development banks or larger regional development banks. And I think uh, that's something that we've, we've tried to uh, work with is, is trying to get these people into the, into the, the lending business because they're, they're, they're too busy lending to telecoms and hotels and, and things which are much easier and nicer uh, for, for, them to, for them to do. And one practical way we found, for example, is to, to buy down some of those costs. So, for example, we have a, a program in Mexico. It's not actually an agribusiness uh, a project, but there we found that we've been able to entice the private sector financing organizations, so commercial banks in, in country, uh, to lend uh, by subsidizing uh, their guarantee fees. So you're buying down some of the cost of them participating in, in, in a financing scheme. That's just one practical way of, of, of taking it forward. Also, the, the idea of working uh, with banks to uh, overcome their barriers uh, through technical assistance is also a very, very useful and very high, high value activity for public funding because you can get a lot of uh, value from, from uh, getting these people on board. Um, I'll take that, that interesting question about you know, the, the holistic approach to getting the incentives right for smallholder farmers. Um, and uh, I think the, the observation with which we started our, our business was that 99% of environmental degradation, including climate change, is driven by economic activity. Um, most economic activity is underpinned by systems of credit. Um, and if we don't uh, get into the rules around uh, credit uh, and how credit is supplied, then uh, all of the other agri-environmental programs that we engage in are only going to be sticking plasters um, because the way in which uh, uh, the, the credit structures are established mean that a perverse incentive is created for the overuse of, of, of natural capital. So, you know, on that observation, I, I can go to the question around, you know, what needs to happen. Well, I think, you know, what we'd like to see ultimately happening is the, the sort of the, the, the fundamental sort of, you know, rules around credit issue changed at a, a national, maybe even international levels. Um, we see a movement towards that happening. Uh, the Financial Stability Board recommendations for, for disclosure of climate risk uh, and mitigation by financial institution boards is a step in the right direction. But we'd really like to see greater, greater sort of, 
um, you know, study and emphasis on that on that point. And in the meantime, uh, and in this very sort of specific sector of smallholder finance provision, um, you know, we we we've you know, created a sort of a solution which provides defined environmental and financial returns. But we've we've stumbled into a greater problem, which is that you know, in the face of climate risk, a number of the the, the businesses. Um, that have been lending hundreds of millions of dollars to smallholder farmers have found themselves on on on, on suddenly um, you know, uh, sort of with, without a business case for 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 continuing and without first loss guarantees and, you know, and potentially also capital or capex subsidies those businesses uh, on whom smallholders depend for their working capital facilities are, are are going to fail and that's a massive 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 adaptation uh, problem. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to ask Angela to, to take the, the podium or to stay here for your uh, final conclusions. Okay, great. So um, thank you. And I've just been sort of listening to all of the comments here and trying to pull out the key themes to play it back to you. Um, and hopefully I've, I've sort of captured everything. Um, um, but the others may want to come, come in and Lini might want to add. Um, so the, the question that we sort of posed at the, in, the start of this session was how do we get from the single figures of climate finance that's flowing to agriculture to hundreds of billions as um, in line with, with the opportunity that's out there and the needs um, to, to mitigate in the sector, but also um, adapt and realize those co-benefits for sustainable development. I think probably the main phrase that's come up is farms of the future. Um, how do we look for um, future financial sustainability of all um, types of farmer and sizes of farm from smallholders right through to large holders and all of the players that are involved in the, the, the supply chain? How do we realize growth in the sector whilst integrating all of the multiple benefits on, on mitigation, adaptation um, and economic growth? Um, I think um, what was sort of where our discussion was going towards is uh, where are the permanent financing solutions to redirect existing financial flows, and there we see the different roles of of different um, um, providers of finance, so the role of public funds and and, and governments. The I heard the high potential leverage of technical assistance, which is an Im Im important point. The role of domestic public budgets and policies, smart subsidies, taxes, um, to um, create and identify opportunities for the private sector, and then the role of, of national and local banks as well. So I think what we've heard with this excellent panel here of um, of of organisations that are really working in this space, um, the, the financial institutions and funds um, that are, are showing great examples of, of progress um, to de-risk um, investments um, for the private sector to build that project pipeline, to look for uh, innovative policies that can can bring private sector to the table. And as Ash said, the, the test bed for innovative financing instruments, technologies and tools that can make all of this happen. So I think we've seen some great examples today. Question is then, what is the next step to really take that to, to scale? Um, and I think you're, you're all part of the solution as well. So thank you. Maybe Lini wants to add. Just to say thank you, everybody. With the permission of the speakers, we'll post these presentations on the CCAFs and probably other websites as well. And we have your emails. If you haven't signed the list, please do. Um, and we'll have an opportunity to share more information that way. So thank you. Thank you to all the speakers, especially. Yeah.